A Patriot's History of the United States, Chapter 20, Part 3. Honey, I shrank the economy. Even though prices were controlled at the pump, Americans felt the oil price hikes ripple through the entire economy via the industrial sector, which had no government protection. This drove up the cost of production, forcing layoffs, pushing the United States into a deep recession. Unemployment rose to 8.5% in 1975, a post-war high, and the gross domestic product, GDP, fell in both 1974 and 1975. The oil-related recession cost the United States as much as 5% of its pre-hike gross national product, GNP, or a level five times greater than the cumulative impact of the Navigation Acts that had started the American Revolution. Great society spending and layers of federal regulations made matters worse. Some states and cities suffered even more than the nation as a whole. New York's liberal spending policy swung the city into bankruptcy, and the mayor asked for a federal bailout. New Yorkers had voted themselves into their problems, then looked to taxpayers from Colorado and Rhode Island to dig them out. President Ford, however, courageously promised to veto any federal bailout of the Big Apple. A local newspaper with typical New York attitude ran the headline, Ford to New York, Drop Dead! In fact, Ford's decision not to reward the city for financial malfeasance was exactly the appropriate constitutional response. Left to their own devices, New Yorkers worked their city back into the black. In almost every area of American life, the federal government had already done quite enough. Whether through the EPA, OSHA, the Consumer Product Safety Commission, or myriad other new agencies, Government at all levels had started to heap voluminous, oppressive regulations on business. In 1975 alone, 177 proposed new rules appeared, as did 2,865 proposed amendments for a total of 10,656 new and proposed rules and amendments, most of which applied to nearly all firms. According to one study, environmental regulations enacted prior to 1999 by themselves, not including the 1970 Clean Air Act, the single largest anti-pollution law, reduced the GNP by 2.5%. Activists such as Ralph Nader and the environmentalists expected the evil corporations to simply absorb the costs, never expressing concern about the average people who had invested in such businesses to provide funds for a new home or a college education for the children. Companies, of course, did not just passively accept the new costly regulations. Instead, American business battled the government on three fronts, including spending for lobbyists in Congress, fighting the new rules in the judicial system, and in the court of public opinion and passing along the costs of the regulations to the consumers. Not surprisingly, the pages in the Federal Register, which contain these rules, ballooned from 10,286 in 1950 to 61,000 in 1978. And at the same time, the numbers of attorneys in the United States rose by 52% in a 10-year period. More important, district court cases grew 131%, and U.S. appeals court civil cases, where product liability cases more likely occurred, exploded by 398%. Predictably, corporations spent more on their legal divisions while spending on research and development. The lifeblood of new products consistently fell. There simply was not enough money to fund both lawyers and scientists. Every dollar spent to influence a lawmaker or run consumer-friendly ads was a dollar not spent on developing better and safer products or reducing the costs of existing goods. By 1980, Americans had four times as many attorneys per capita as Germany and 20 times more per capita than Japan 
both of which had surged ahead of the United States in productivity, the key indicator of real economic growth. Meanwhile, big business was working against itself by avoiding change and innovation the way dogs resist baths. Significantly, not one of the top 50 technological changes in the 20th century America came from established leaders in the field. IBM did not create the personal computer, nor did the calculator giant of IBM's day, the slide rule company, Cuffle, create the punch card computer. Airplanes sprang from the minds of bicycle mechanics and word processing programs from the scribbling of college dropouts. Cellular phones were not developed by AT&T or even the famous Bell Labs. Stability had served industry well when the United States passed some of the other fading economic powers, then easily perpetuated growth during the post-war decade when there was little competition. But then complacency set in. Once the Japanese and Germans re-entered world markets, U.S. companies lacked the competitive edge that had served them well half a century earlier. Afraid of rapid change, corporations introduced only marginal improvements. Automakers for almost two decades thought that merely by tweaking a body style or introducing minor interior comforts, they could compete with dramatic changes in actual auto design from Japan. Japanese car makers had struggled for 10 years to adapt their vehicles to American roads and to larger American physiques. So when oil prices suddenly placed greater value on smaller front-wheel drive fuel-efficient cars, Honda, Nissan, and Toyota were more than ready. To their discredit, American auto executives continued to denigrate foreign innovations. It took a bankrupt Chrysler Corporation under Lee Iacocca, the brains behind the Ford Mustang, to shock Detroit out of its doldrums. We were wrong, he announced in one of Chrysler's television ads. New industrial evangelists like Iacocca, even had they been in the majority, constituted only half the equation for turning American business around. Labor, led by the hard scrabble union bosses who had achieved great gains at tremendous cost in the 50s and 60s, still acted as though it spoke for the majority of Americans. By the 70s, however, the unions were losing members at precipitous rates. Trade unions had formed a critical part of the Democratic Party's New Deal coalition, and the most important organizations, the AFL-CIO and the Teamsters, were able to demand exceptionally high wages for their members in the automobile, steel, and trucking industries. By 1970, a typical worker in Detroit commanded $22 an hour, in 1990s dollars, owned two cars, a boat, and a vacation home on a lake, or the equivalent of the earnings of a mid-level attorney in 2002. Miners and truckers, as well as those working in manufacturing jobs, had substantially higher incomes than many professionals and received better benefits than people in almost any income category. Unionized employees routinely made between $10,000 and $12,000 per year with overtime. New homes sold for about $23,000, meaning that a worker dedicating 30% of his income to a mortgage could own a house in six or seven years, which compared quite closely to a current-day professional earning a $100,000 salary and supporting a $250,000 mortgage. More significantly, For the long-term survival of American industry, the unions had demanded, and weak CEOs had agreed to, lavish medical and retirement plans. By the first decade of the 21st century, General Motors would pay more for the medical coverage of its employees than it did for all the raw materials it needed to make cars. Such benefits were utterly unsustainable. Higher prices in steel and autos was passed on to consumers, which added to inflation. American manufactured products, especially textiles, steel, autos, and electronics, rose in price relative to foreign competition. In steel alone, the cost of labor was six times that of foreign competitors. Sometime in the early 1970s, 
prices exceeded the threshold that most consumers were willing to pay in order to remain loyal to American-made products, and buyers began to switch to foreign goods. Recapturing formerly loyal customers is twice as difficult as holding them. Japanese and European manufacturers who were turning out lower-priced quality goods gained millions of new American customers in the 1970s. For the first time, made in Japan was not viewed as a sign of cheap, shoddy goods, but as a mark of quality. Foreign competitors increased their steel production by some 700 million net tons, and builders scrambled to replace expensive American steel with fiberglass, aluminum, plastic, ceramics, and concrete. American steel companies took the biggest hit of all. The industry had seen its international market share fall 20% since the Korean War, when U.S. steelmakers claimed 60% of the world's sales. Worse, only one new steel plant, a Bethlehem facility in Indiana, was constructed between 1950 and 1970. At the same time, Japan gave birth to 53 new integrated steel companies, most of them with brand new efficient mills, and Japanese assets and steel plants rose 23% between 1966 and 1972, compared to an investment in the American plants of only 4%. Overall, output of U.S.-made steel barely changed between 1948 and 1982 leading many steel executives to try to diversify their companies. Layoffs began with the expectation that they would be temporary. Then weeks stretched into months and into years. By 1980, it was clear that after years of sounding unheeded warnings, the wolf had finally come, and the industry would never return to its 1960s peak. This was the last gasp of organized union power in manufacturing America. From 35% of American workforce in 1960, union membership entered a downward spiral to 27% of the workforce in 1990. That did not tell the whole story, however, because the hardcore industrial unions had plunged even more sharply than the total, which was kept afloat only by the two largest unions in America the National Education Association, NEA, and the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, AFS-CME. By 1980, the AFS-CME had twice the membership of the United Steel Workers. Thus, it became eminently clear why organized labor had a commitment to permanently large and growing government and to public schools. Those employees operating monopolies outside the free market now represented unions' only hope of long-term survival. The ensuing recession shattered the underlying premises of Keynesian economics once and for all. According to the prevailing Phillips curve theory, an economy could not have both high unemployment and high inflation at the same time. This stemmed from the notion that inflation resulted from government spending for new jobs. It was all poppycock. The government could not create wealth in the 1970s any more than it could in the 1930s. More accurately, a bizarre expectations game occurred, taxflation, wherein businesses sensed that when new government programs were announced, their taxes would go up, and they responded by hiking prices merely in anticipation of the new taxes. Gerald Ford possessed none of the qualities needed to deal with any aspect of the sinking economy. As a progressive, so-called moderate Republican, he sympathized with much of the great society spending. As a caretaker president, he did not possess the public support to force OPEC to increase production or lower prices. And as a Nixon appointee, he faced a hostile and rogue Congress out to destroy all vestiges of the modern Republican Party, much the way the radical Republicans in Reconstruction had hoped to kill the Democratic Party. All Ford had in his favor was honesty, but his lack of imagination left him helpless in the face of further business declines. 
having no desire for tax cuts that might revive the economy, and blocked by a spendthrift Congress that would not enact tax cuts anyway, Ford launched a campaign that was almost comedic in design. He sought to mobilize public support to hold down prices by introducing WIN, Whip Inflation Now, buttons. The damage done to the American economy by almost a decade of exorbitant social spending, increasing environmental and workplace regulation, and Keynesian policies from the Johnson-Nixon administration cannot be overstated. Yet, just as government almost never gets the credit when economic growth occurs, so too its overall impact on the nation's business health must be tempered with the appreciation for the poor planning and lack of innovation in the corporate sector. All that combined with the impact of green union demands in heavy industry made any foolish policies of government relatively insignificant. Perhaps worst of all, inflation had eroded earnings, creating new financial pressures for women to work. And we'll continue with the next section titled Sex, the Church, and the Collapse of Marriage in the next video. Please like, subscribe, and leave a comment below. I'd love to hear from you guys. I love you. As Tigger says, ta-ta for now.